Thank you for joining us. Isn't life exhilarating? Every day, we have an opportunity to learn something new. About 10 years ago, I worked at UCSB as a greenhouse manager. On the very first day of my experience there, the gardener said to me, don't kill the caterpillars on this plant. They're going to be monarch butterflies. I grew up in Wisconsin, and I could never recall seeing a monarch butterfly. I had no idea what I was in for. But in two weeks, I had to learn fast. Thank goodness for the internet. And if you want to learn more about monarchs and see the whole life cycle, go on the internet. In two weeks, I had caterpillars and chrysalises hanging on the outside of the greenhouse window. I had them under the tables. I had them on a coiled up garden hose as a chrysalis. So I had to learn how to take that off because I wanted to use the garden hose. Now the first thing we need to learn about pollination is to identify what we want to have. Now, in this area, we need to know what kind, of, what kind of pollinators are here, what kind of butterflies are you after, because they're all different. They're absolutely all different. And the most important thing is to learn the life cycle. And you probably know the life cycle of the monarch butterfly, but I'm going to go through it with you quickly. And I'm not an artist, as you can see, but let me show you. Every butterfly has a specific host plant. And a host plant, you know, if you're going to a party, you want to give a hostess gift, right? Because that hostess lives in that house. So it's basically the host plant of the butterfly. For a monarch, it's Asclepias or milkweed. There are lots of different milkweeds. In the East Coast, they have one kind. In the West and Midwest, they all have different kinds, but it's okay, they all have milkweed. And the milkweed has this white substance in it that is poisonous. The caterpillars eat it, and it's not poisonous to them, but if something eats the caterpillar, they will get very sick and may die. So if a bird eats one, he'll never want to eat that again for lunch. So that's why they have that. So the butterflies will only lay the eggs on the milkweed for the monarchs. For other butterflies, they have their own host plants. Now, so first there's a mama butterfly, and they lay the eggs on the leaf, usually only one or two on a leaf, depending how desperate they are. If, if there's not enough milkweed, they may lay more. The eggs will hatch in four to five days. If it's warm, they'll, they'll hatch faster. And if it's cooler, it may take a while. I had one the other day come out. It had to be seven days old. I, I thought he was a goner until I found this little speck. He was a day old. So they're, they're hatching, and they turn into caterpillars. And they're really very small, and they must have food. So I have them in here, and I keep feeding them milkweed. There'll be a caterpillar about two weeks. Again, it depends how warm it is or how cool it is. But about two weeks, there'll be a caterpillar. And I know someone noticed mine is on the ground, and it probably did not fall there. They like their privacy. They like to walk around and possibly look for places to become a chrysalis. Not only that, they want to protect themselves from predators. So in the morning, you'll say, oh, look at this caterpillar. And in two minutes, you'll go out there, and then they'll be gone, and you'll say, what happened? Or they all went away. I don't have any anymore. Well, they're, they're incognito. They want to hide because they want to protect themselves. So that's why they do that. And that's why it's important for you to understand what they look like. And to, when you have milkweed, it's good to have some mulch and other plants because they walk around looking. And I have found them three blocks away on, on a 
cement road. And I thought, where are they going? There is no milkweed here. I know there isn't. And I picked it up and I moved it. But when they're down like this, they may be wanting to change their clothes. They molt. So they're in this little skin and they eat so much and their clothes is so tight. So they have to molt. And if you've ever seen that, you can go on the internet and watch it happen. In fact, I think my, um, well, I didn't plug it in, so it may not work, but you can watch it on the internet. And what they do is they grab onto the, with their feet, the front feet and their back feet, and they stay there and they rock back and forth. And they, and they could be there for a whole day. So if you see them here for two days, not to worry. I've had some three days, and when you're not looking, they will walk right out of their clothes. And from the head, it's amazing. I, when I, I was shocked when I saw this, but they'll walk right out of their clothes, and uh, the head will drop off, and they'll walk out, and he'll have a brand new head. Isn't that convenient? And then they, uh, they're bigger, and they can eat more. And then they'll do the same thing. They'll do that four times. And the last time the monarchs do it will be hanging on something. Um, and in here, they'll go up on here. In the wild, they'll go anywhere uh, to be hidden because it's a very dangerous time for them. So they're up here and uh, th they're hanging. At, you know, just imagine the caterpillar is hanging up here and it's in a J form. It looks like a J. That's why they call it the, the J. And then after it's there, it could be hours, it could be days, the J part will just release and it'll be just up and down like that. And then that's when they're gonna start doing it. And so they hook themselves upside down. They're hanging on by their feet. It's, it's, a, it's a silk thread and they're hanging on. And, and it, they just slip right, it just, it's like taking your clothes off with you not using your hands and they're wiggling and shaking and then the skin on the bottom just splits and it comes up. And the first time I saw it was on a Christmas Eve. My, my son and I had to put up a camera to watch them because I really wanted to see what they were doing. And we found it just in time and all of a sudden the skin just sucked up and here this very light green chrysalis was revealed. And then it went around like that really fast and the little black skin fell off. They wanna make sure the skin is off. So sometimes if you see that, you'll see a little puddle of black skin because they don't want that. They don't want somebody to know what they're doing. You know, the predators might identify that. And then they'll be like this for two weeks. And just before they come out, it'll turn black. And you can start watching. Then on the top, on the very top there, you can tell that it's gonna come out because it'll slip a little, it'll just stretch a little bit on the very top and then out comes a butterfly. And it has to hang up without incumbing its wings because if it has to pump all this blood, uh, butterfly blood, into its wings to be standing out like that and then it can start moving. So it's important to just leave them alone then. Now, if they fall off of them, and I, they have, they've, or you might find one on the ground, you can always put your finger there and they'll be happy to crawl on your finger and not to be afraid. And then you can get it to go on something else for sturdiness so they can, they can be happy there. And then it'll take a few hours maybe and then they'll fly away. So if they do it in the house, uh, if you, and they're missing, look at the windows. Look, look at the windows and try to get them outside. They have to eat in, an, in the day. In, in, they can eat in the, you know, at 24 hours, but um, you don't want them too long because they need their nutrition. So that's all about the monarch. So this is it. We're done with this one. Now sometimes I go to schools and I talk about butterflies pollination to the kids. And a while back, a couple years ago, one of the teachers at a local school, not here, uh, 
Mrs. Rose, I'll call her. She invited me because she said Larry, the gardener, told her that if she planted a passion fruit, a passion vine, she would get caterpillars. I mean, I'm sorry, she would get butterflies. And she was really excited. She planted this in a beautiful arbor, and she asked me to come and see her. So you, I wish you would have been with me the day we got there. It was a perfect day. The, the flowers were smelling beautifully, and it was just such a nice day. You just wanted to sit out there and watch everything. And as we're walking down to the arbor, she had a big smile on her face. As we got closer, her smile disappeared. And she said, Joan, Larry said I would have butterflies, but all I get are these horrible worms that I have to keep killing because there won't be a plant left for the butterflies to get. Well, Mrs. Rose learned something that day, and I explained the whole metamorphosis to her. Now, this is called um, metamorphosis as they're going through their system, but after I told her, just leave them alone, a month later, she called me and she said, oh my goodness, we have so many butterflies. Thank you so much. So it's important to understand what's happening. And if you go to other places and you see different butterflies, you have to understand they're gonna look totally different. Some look really scary. Uh, they are red with black spikes on. Some are yellow. Uh, they're, all, they're all different. So why do we want to talk about pollination? What is pollination? What do I have up here? No, not this one. I'm going to put something over here. Have you ever grabbed a flower and put your nose to it and all of a sudden you had yellow stuff on your nose? Well, that was probably pollen or aphids. But more than likely it was pollen. More than likely it was pollen. And so pollination is actually when the, the male, the plants have male and female parts. And some of them, some plants have male parts on just one flower and a female on the other, but this plant I'm showing you has both. So the stamens is a male part, and there's an anther, this one here, and on the lily you can usually see it really well. They're sticking up and they're powdery yellow. So that's the pollen. And the female part is the stigma, that's the middle part here. So pollination is when the pollen gets into the stigma and then it goes down to the middle and it, it, it's pollinated and then something will start growing from that. So why do we care about pollination? According to the National Academy of Sciences, over 75% of flowering plants require pollination in order to produce seeds or fruits. And from these, they said years ago, came one third of our food and a much greater proportion for animals from tiny, tiny songbirds to grizzly bears. They all require pollination to provide their food. I'm sure we have more than one third now of food. Uh, when you next time you sit down for a meal, look at your plate and, and think about thanking a bee for pollinating, possibly pollinating that that uh, piece of food. Now the other thing I want to show you: an apple is at the heart of why you should care about pollination. If you op if you cut an apple, not up and down, but sideways like this, you should see a five-pointed star. 
at each point of that star should be two seeds. If it was fully pollinated, you would have 10 seeds altogether. And that's when enough pollen reached that flower stigma. Now, if you don't see that, and a lot of times it won't be perfect like this, but it'll be somewhat. If it hasn't gotten enough pollen, it'll be a smaller apple. It won't maybe have 10 seeds. It'll have maybe five or not even. But that's what happens when you have a smaller apple. You don't have the proper pollination. Now, to identify pollinators is, is more complicated because you know, you know what a bear looks like? Mama bear, papa bear, they kind of look the same. And baby bear looks the same but smaller. Well, there are no baby butterflies. There are no baby ladybugs. They are different, totally different, and that's what we're, we're doing. Now, the ladybugs, we explained about the butterflies. Uh, now, the ladybugs, I have a lot of nasturtiums in my yard, and they lo aphids love nasturtiums. So if you have lots of aphids in your garden, you have the best habitat for ladybugs. Does anybody, have, have you seen ladybugs in your garden with, with the different stages? When the mama lays the eggs, she'll lay it on a place only where there are lots of aphids, because that's what they eat. They don't eat the leaves at all. They only eat the aphids or little tiny insects. And when they lay them, they lay them in a row of yellow standing up, and it's under under the leaf. So you'd have to go look in, uh, under the leaf. I've seen them, though. And they're there for maybe four days, and they'll hatch into the larva. Now, the larva look like baby alligators. It's just amazing. They are black and orange, and they look just like baby alligators. So they'll be baby alligators for a while, and that's called the larva. Instead of the caterpillar, that's the larva. They look like baby alligators. And then they'll go into a, a pupa, and they look kind of orange and black, but they also look very dried out and dead. So you think, oh, that's one that came out already but it didn't. It's still there, and then it'll come out of there, and it'll look like a ladybug, but only yellow. It won't have the, the spots on it. It won't be orange yet. It'll be just yellow. It'll take maybe two, three days before it gets its normal color that you expect. So I have this up here later on if you want to come see the life cycle. It's, um, it's on there. Now, my, uh, my sister lives in Wisconsin. My twin sister lives in Wisconsin, actually. And her, she and her husband, they love to make pickles. They grow cucumbers like crazy. He goes out every single day and picks the very small ones, brings them in, and then he makes cucumber pickles with them. So for pickles, he wants dill. So they grow tons and tons of dill. And the seed from the dill one year just blew all over the patio. and. When I got there, there was a whole bunch of dill. And, and the dill was nice. It was this high, it smelled great. And I sat down and I said, wow, you must have a lot of, of um, swallowtail cat uh, butterflies here. She said, why? I said, well, this is the larva plant for swallowtails. And she looked at me real strange. Her eyes got real big and she said, oh no, that's what they were. Last year, we had so many of those, we had to keep killing them. And one even got in a jar. And, and she was really upset. But then I told her, I'd explained that you gotta share and they have plenty to share. So now they're excited about it. They go out and look for the caterpillars, even her husband. I couldn't believe it. He said, Joe, look, it, I found a caterpillar today. I couldn't believe it. Even Frank, amazing. But anyway, so it's important to understand what they look like. And so if you want to get swallowtails, you can plant dill or uh, fennel here, the wild fennel, they grow on that. I see one flying through my yard every once in a while. I know my neighbor has the fennel. Now another... So the four stages are complete 
metamorphosis. And besides caterpillars or butterflies, the native bees also have this four stage metamorphosis. It's called um, complete metamorphosis. If it's just metamorphosis, it's only three stages. If it's complete, it's four stages. So I don't have a big, big one here, but first the adults for a native bee. Now, how many of you have seen, a, let's say a carpenter bee, a black, a big black carpenter? Uh, okay, so you know what they look like. Now, most native bees are really tiny and you don't notice them, but do you remember seeing that same bee the year later? You won't, because the reason we don't know about native bees is because they only reveal themselves to us four to six weeks a year. Now, maybe the, the um, carpenter bees are here longer, but the regular, the mason bees and the, um, the other bees, they have a different method. And so the adults will emerge, and the mason bees will emerge in the early spring when it's time to pollinate the early spring plants and fruit trees. They will mate and then they will lay their eggs and they will die. Now the other bees do the same thing except in the summer. And, uh, and they will pollinate for the summer fruits and vegetables and herbs. So they're, they're mason bees and the um, the other bees will go for this. So what happens with the native bees is they will uh, they will emerge, and then the females will look for a mate and they will mate, and the male will have nothing else to do with the whole process. The female goes out and looks for a tunnel, some soil to build a little tube in it. And sometimes you can even put these things out for them. But if you, if you notice, in the ground, so they'll, they'll make a tube all through the ground. It could be pretty deep, because the children will come back and use the same tunnel. So the mama will go out and gather pollen and saliva, and she'll put uh, it in a round ball. It'll be called bee bread. And she'll take it down the tube and deposit it there and lay one egg on it. Then she'll go out and she'll look for some mud, and she'll cover that one up. Then she'll go out and gather more, po more pollen, make bee bread, deposit that on top of that one, and she'll build a little condo. They'll all have their separate little cells. And then she only lived, as we see it, out in the earth for like four to six weeks. And then she dies. But the bee bread will, will um, be the food for the, for the egg hatching. And that egg will be in that tube in the earth or in the reed or you know somewhere else all year long for the native bees. So in the spring, well, it'll, it'll mature and then it'll just stay there until it's time for it to come out. And the mason bees come out in the early spring to pollinate the, the blueberries and, and things like that. So that's why we never see them. We only see the bees that you're thinking about four to six to, uh, uh, weeks a year if you're lucky. And, but there are 4,000 native bees in the United States. And some are so tiny, and I'm sure you've seen them, but you thought, oh, they're wasps or they're insects. But they're native bees, and they don't sting. That's what's so great about native bees, are they don't sting. Um, I have an example of these. When you're, actually, I bought these. You can buy native bees and grow them just like the butterflies. But these are in a tube, and you can come up and look at them when you're done. And you can handle them. And back when I got them, they were crawling all over my hands, and they don't bite, they don't sting. So it's really a great thing to have them. And you can buy things like this. And, uh, or I was on a kick to make my own bee houses. 
Now the problem with this, this is what I used to do and I drilled all these holes. You don't, they're not clean. So next year we might get mites. And then if you use it again and you don't clean it up, you're in trouble because the mites will take care of you. So what you could do when you start out, for those of us old enough, I never smoked, but some people rolled their own cigarettes. You could roll little papers like this and stick them in here. Or you could buy little tubes and put them in there and cut this off at the right amount. So then every year you could take them out after the babies left and have it clean again. So that's one way. But I'm not gonna go into that a whole lot. But on your handout, I want you to make sure you see this must-see video, Crown Bees. There are several how-to videos there and it explains this in much more detail. They also sell different things if you wanna go that far. But for most of us, we just need to provide pollinator habitat. Now the leaf cutter bees are the ones that come out in the summer to pollinate most. So you can actually buy mason bees or and leaf cutter bees at a different time. Now the bumble bees are a bit different. They are social. They have groups, but they don't have millions of their friends living with them. They have smaller groups, maybe 200, and they're usually in the soil. So if you have them, hopefully they're in a place that's away and not by your front door. I had a friend who had them right by the front door and she didn't want anybody to move them and she unfortunately destroyed them, but they're, they're good, good people. And if you go to a greenhouse that grows tomatoes, tomatoes have to be pollinated by very specific um, bees. And bumblebees are perfect because bumblebees have that buzzing action and it shakes the pollen and it, they all get pollinated. So in, in the nur, uh, native, um, I'm sorry, in nurseries where they're growing tomatoes for commercial, they have boxes of bumblebees and they keep them there all year. So that's really a, a good thing for them. So if you wanna be a hero to those pollinators, it's providing habitat. And so let's kind of start with the soil. What's, what's really important, I know somebody said that they have clay, and I know I had terrible soil when I first started. After I remodeled, the workers put all the worst soil on, on my ground. So I had, um, I had compost brought in, and maybe if you have a small area, they have different kinds of compost here, something to be good in the, in the soil. You can ask those what they're selling. Or if you have a whole bunch, they have a whole uh, area over here that you can have truckloads of stuff brought in. Once you get your soil, your planter beds done, and maybe you plant it a year, you really do not want to dig this up again. You can carefully open an area and add more, or maybe four inches on top. I really like worm castings. And this is called worm gold. Um, do, does it come in larger bags than this? This is the largest. Well, I usually get mine in a lot, lot bigger bag, but this is really good to have. It's called worm castings, and basically it's worm poop. Okay, so it's worm poop, and it's incredibly nutritious. It's really n incredibly nutritious. Soil is really a living entity. You think it's dirt, but it's not dirt. It's soil. It's, it's a, a living entity. When I went to horticulture school, our teacher had us go out and get a teaspoon of soil and put it under a microscope. And I wasn't too good with the microscope. And everybody kind of found everything, and, and I'm fooling around with it. It's going up and down, and it's not working. And he went on to something else, and I wasn't paying attention. He was talking about something totally different, and I'm looking, and all of a sudden, I found my important things in the soil, and I, I, I don't like worms. I really don't like worms. And I found these my monster worms in my microscope, and I screamed, and I jumped up, and I'm looking around. He said, well, I guess Joan has healthy soil. So it's also important when you're digging in the dirt like that to wash your hands, because some of those might give you tummy trouble. When I see a lot of the work, workers, uh, I knew a, a lady who was a nurse and her uh, father was a um, landscaper 
and he would put his sandwich on the ground and he was always sick and she said you can't do that you've got to wash your hands and you've got to put it on something you can't do that so you want to wash your hands after that because there are so many monsters in that soil and good monsters and when you uh, when you prune a plant like I was talking um, the, the milkweed possibly maybe four or five times a year you need to cut it down because of a disease you might have a disease and once you cut especially a milkweed down to the ground the roots grow much faster and bigger and with cutting down almost everything, it releases, you leave the roots in there. If you're pruning, like, like bizinias, instead of pulling them up, I cut them off and leave the soil, leave the roots in there because they'll turn into good stuff. And when you have that action of cutting it, it releases a good stuff in the soil. And it'll, there, some of it will die off and it'll feed all these good, um, these good bugs, fungi and mycorrhizae. And, th and that's how you really get good soil. So if, you, if you, you have bad soil and you put this stuff on and you leave it there for you know, a while, uh, say a year, and you're growing stuff, and then you come out with a rototiller, you're ruining the, the soil. Because say the good soil, say this is the top, and there's some mycorrhizae, a certain kind, let's say A mycorrhizae. And then over here, this B mycorrhizae. And here is C mycorrhizae or good fungi. Once you mix it all up, they got to start all over. So it's that's why you want to just put some worm castings down and water it in. Now I have experienced white fly on my neighbor's hibiscus, and I mean it's like snowing, a blizzard, and it was just horrible. And I found that if I put on maybe maybe two of those bags on the ground and water them in and maybe dig them in a little bit and water them next year i had no white fly or very few it was a miracle so every time i plant i plant with worm castings like this worm work and especially on my fruit trees everybody says where do you get all those lemons my lemon tree i i give hundreds away one tree and uh, it's right by the street and i just put them out for people but I put worm gold on them, and I fertilize with chicken manure or steer manure. So it, if you want to mix some chicken and steer together, you're having different benefits because they're all so specific. Last week, I was at a farm called Apricot Lane. I think it was Apricot Farms. Have you heard of it? Have you been there? It's amazing. Uh, Sometimes they have tours, but it's, it's a, they have 65 employees, and they have this huge farm with a lot of fruit trees. And I went there because I wanted to know, learn about carbon sequestering. You know, we have all this horrible stuff in the air and how to get it down. And as gardeners, we are helping because in all the plants here is bringing some of that carbon into the soil where it belongs. And every time you cut the soil open and plow, that carbon is going up again. That's why the industrial revolution and all this agriculture is digging and digging. It's all coming up and then we're saying we have bad, bad air. But anyway, I went there and I saw what they were doing. You don't have farms probably, but so imagine this is a field and it's not a very big field. So they had a fence in one third here and one third here. So here was, one cow and a calf. They just happen to have a dairy cow and a calf. So their theory was to put the calf and the cow here for a day or two. And what they wanted that cow to do is trample on this side one third of the green. It was some were weeds, some were alfalfa or whatever they had planted. And one third they wanted to have eaten. And one third they wanted to have left. So when it looked about that, they moved it to this one, this part of the field, and it had a fence so they couldn't go back. Now the, and, and then, so it was here maybe a day or two, and then it, it trampled and it ate, so then it was moved here. And then next week it'll go somewhere else, and until these recover. Now the theory behind it is, when they trample the soil, then there's no bare soil. There's green, broken on it and it's going to turn into mulch basically good mulch and then one third they're going to eat which they want to eat and once you cut things down 
the roots grow better. And then that one part is still green and growing, and all the beneficials can live there. And they had, they had lambs, and they had geese, and, and they used all of this manure, and they were getting horse manure from the neighbors, and a 40-foot compost bin, 40 feet. My goodness, I was afraid to go in that room. But uh, it was amazing. It was just amazing. So that's kind of what you can help with the soil. I kind of got away on this. And the other thing uh, to get a better pollination is to get rid of the lawn. I have no lawn. It's okay to have a little bit of lawn. It's I can't afford to water my plants, so I'm watering my fruit trees. And I always put mulch down around them. I don't want to have any bare soil except for uh, the native bees. It's always good to find a place that you can have good drainage in the sun. It has to be in the sun with good drainage. It could be an area the size of this table. It could be the size of this. But to have a place for the bees, the native bees that could burrow down is important. Because if you cover everything with wheat cloth and with mulch, it's not going to help them any. And native bees, they really are incredible. After I'm finished talking, I have this to show you. It says six mason bees, the bees we were talking about, can pollinate as much as 360 honeybees can because they're different. They're made totally different. They have much hairier bodies. They have little pouches. They have little pouches where they stick the pollen and they are going back to that tube to feed, to that tube to feed their babies or to get their, uh, lay their eggs. And that's why, and they're not specific. Like honeybees, a lot of times, they're used to going to blueberries and they just go to the blueberries. So they're more of a monoculture kind of thing or if they maybe go to, uh, you know, some other plant. But uh, native bees, they can go to this plant and that plant and pollinate different plants. Now, bees, they don't know they're doing us a favor. I mean, they really don't know that they're pollinating. What they want is their food. They want to provide for them, you know, them, themselves. So we need to be more kind to them, I think. Now, sometimes you might go in on a hike and you see, oh, there's an ant nest. And sometimes it won't be an ant nest. It could be a, a bee nest. Because you'll see if you have a, a area, and I've seen somebody with um, kind of a raised area, like a you know just a raised area, and that's where the bees were, I, because it was easy to get to, and they were not disturbed. But then you might see them coming up. Sometimes in cracks of sidewalks, you might see the bees going down, and that's what they are underneath is a is a is their house. Somewhere in the East Coast, I don't know if it was in Maryland or what, but this farmer had wonderful luck with his growing. And then he decided he needed to plow his fields and some other area, make it bigger. And he plowed up this entire area where there were native bees, just destroyed so much. He had no idea they were there. And it would take just years and years to get it back. So when you want to care for the bees, save space for the bees with bare ground, and they want a sunny area with good drainage and no mulch. Now, let me see what else did I have in here. I know I didn't ask, answer everybody's question. Oh, I know, I wanted to tell you about plants. Now we have several plants here that are good for pollinators. If you want to attract hummingbirds, find the tubular flowers, like the salvias. And I, I use some black and blue, um, it's called black and blue salvia, but it's a runner. It, it really, if you have it here, you'll have it there next year. So it's, you know, you gotta be kind of careful. But there are certain things that are just excellent for, for pollination. And on here, I have some websites, too. And um, Las Pesitas site, they're a wholesaler. They have excellent pictures and native plants for a gardener. They really have a lot of information. 
and uh, the d different things, butterflies, all of these will give you phenomenal hints. Now for a um, butterfly, what you want to have is a flat area so they can land. Butterflies taste with their feet. When they go on a plant, they know that there's pollen there because of their feet. And that proboscis, if you ever seen when a butterfly first comes out, you'll see this long tongue going back and forth and you'll notice it's two tongues. It's basically when it comes out two tongues and it has to go back and forth, back and forth to make one tongue. And that's, it's like a straw and that's how it can go into the echinacea or the flower. So I really like zinnias of all kinds. And it's good to have taller plants because the butterflies don't want to go in the ground. It's too dangerous. So they go up. Now this kind of zinnia uh, on, in my yard is about, well now it's about this high. It's really tall. So get the tall ones and uh, only the short ones if you have a um, pot that's, that's up. Now this is my other favorite. This is called the tetonia and I have it on that list and it's a Mexican sunflower. So when you plant this one, it'll get maybe this wide and it'll come up and it'll have, you know, different ones going out. So it really makes a nice one. And when you're planting for monarch, for um, pollinators, totally, imagine if you're flying over this garden and you see one pansy. You're not going to see one pansy. You need to have a whole bunch of something that's kind of tall. And so when you're planting, let's say I'm planting right in here, and this whole group here will have one plant, one species rather. Maybe you'll have eight plants. So this whole area, when I look at you, you'll be all zinnias. When they fly over, they can find them. And then maybe over here, we'll have another bunch of zinnias. So they could go back and forth. And, and then over here, maybe we'll do lavender. I love lavender. And so you'll have a, a, a bit of lavender. So they'll have areas that they can go to easily and find something. Also with the milkweed, you want to put maybe three or four plants together and maybe three or four milkweed over there too. And let me explain about milkweed. When you buy it, it'll look pretty decent. But you've got to remember, this is their food. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be eaten totally. And you have to leave it there. And you can cut it down, because when you cut it down, the roots get stronger, and it'll come back stronger than ever. So once you cut it down, you water it, and then it'll come back stronger than ever, as fast as you can imagine. I know uh, when I was walking through here, I saw some purple ones. There's some purple ones like this, and they're on sale now, aren't they? I thought I saw a sale sign. But if you want something easy and you've got a big area, like some of you have told me, these can spread quite a bit. And they make a whole bunch of color, and, and there were some purple ones there. And, and here. But they, these are some of the easiest plants, and they love them. The bees love them, the butterflies love them. Everything loves these plants. So in your walking around, you can see, um, in your, your garden or when you're at your neighbors, you can see what's landing on what. That's what I always look at, who's landing on, on what plant. But I've seen them on here so many times. So if you want to. The penta. If you go to the botanical garden or the Natural History Museum, now they have the butterflies, I think. And if you go, they have pentas. And this is where I've seen a lot of butterflies land. This is a beautiful plant. This is a graffita violet. I've never seen this color. This is gorgeous. But So you maybe would want a few of these instead of just one. 15 inches high, space in 12. When it says space in 12, they mean on center. That means from one pot to the next is 12. It's, you know, it's when you're trying to figure out what that means on center, so it's 12 inches from here to the next pot. But imagine if you just had this, it wouldn't be enough for the butterfly flying over or the hummingbird or whatever, so you want to have a grouping, ideally. Always plant in groups.
The other thing about pesticides, if you want to have a real pollinator garden, you do not use pesticides because pesticides will kill it. Now they say there's a safe pesticide, it's called BT. It's not. It is designed to kill caterpillars. So if you're thinking of spraying your cucumbers with BT, and then you're having your butterflies next to it, you don't want to do that because BT is made specifically, and a lot of people think, oh, this is a safe one, and it, because it's a natural something, but it's going to kill them. I mean, really, it does. Because of the drought, the butterflies are really having a hard time. Now, do you have you been to Elwood? Elwood is north is north of UCSB in Goleta, and that used to be the place you go to see butterflies. The monarchs would be there in the thousands about the year 2002 or so I was there and there were tons of them. If you ever go to a place like that and you're expecting butterflies, bring binoculars because if there truly are butterflies, you'll look at the tree and you'll say, I don't see any butterflies. They are so many on there that you can't tell. They look like leaves. So you have to have binoculars. But don't waste your time going to Elwood because this drought has wiped it out. I went last November and it looked like a hurricane hit it. It was really sad. All the trees were, I mean, literally falling down and it was a very dangerous place. I was surprised they didn't close it sooner. And now they're cutting down thousands of trees and trying to figure out what to do. Um, Pismo had a pretty good year this year. But always get some binoculars because people go there and, well, there are no bi butterflies, and I say, well, look here, and they, oh my goodness, look at this. So it's important to know what you're doing. Now, pollinators are in trouble because we have so many houses going up. When I was a kid, I lived in Wisconsin on a farm, and there, when you drove down the gravel road, there were lots of weeds on the ground, fields empty, pollinators happy. We didn't even know what pollinators were. I mean, but. Uh, but that's what they were. And now I go back and they're paved roads and big, big farmers. I lived in San Jose for quite a few years. And when, uh, th and this was before I really went to horticulture school or before I really learned about pollinators. And my husband and I, we, uh, my daughter had a pot-bellied pig. And when she went to college, I said, no more potbelly pig, because it had a little corner of the yard that looked like crap. And I said, that's got to go. So little orphan hammies took the potbelly pig. And I got my corner back. So I put in a little raised area. There was It was a little higher in the corner, because the next neighbor was just maybe three feet higher. So I got some stepping stones, and I got some boulders, and I put in a bench. And something very interesting happened that I didn't even know about. We put the bench in, and then we found that the sun was at our back, and we could be reading them uh, uh, in later, later in the evening because the sun was in the back, and we could be reading. Plus, we found that was a perfect place for our martinis. So we called it our martini bench. And First it was just a bench, and then I thought I felt selfish, so I got a, I called it a king and queen chair. It was a, it was a teak chair. So we put those on the side, and then we could share it with our friends. So that was really nice. So my husband and I are sitting there one night, drinking our martinis, and I planted lavender right at our feet, because I love lavender, and I put the lavender right at our feet. And we're looking down, and my husband says, I have never seen so many insects in our garden. And I said, I didn't either, because who sits close to their plants? We, we sit by the, off the patio where there's cement. And um, here were these, and I said, my goodness, it looks like they're having a good time. There were bees and, and different, different ones, and they weren't bothering us at all. And I thought, wow, I had no idea. I had a pollinator garden before I knew what it was. So that was really exciting. So tell me. What is the first thing you're going to think about doing when you plan your garden? The most important thing you can do, of all the things I just said, put in a martini bench. <laughs> Maybe not a martini bench. You could have a coffee place, but I have a very small yard. Uh, my yard 
well, is no bigger than this, this, it's, you know, this planter area, you know, from the buildings, but you've, I've got 10 or 12 places to sit. Uh, I open my doors and there's a place to sit. I go out to a corner and there is a place to sit. My neighbor's mowing the lawn and I don't want to sit there, so I go here. Uh, the dog's barking there, so I go there. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. Everybody comes over and they say, you have more places to sit than you have plants, but I, I have lots of plants too. But that's really important. And I wouldn't have known, if I didn't sit at that martini bench and look at those plants, I wouldn't have known. I used to do gardening, uh, landscaping uh, design for a while, and I, I uh, this one lady in um, Santa Barbara, or San Jose, I, I uh, took out all the lawn and we made berms, and uh, I said, and you need to have a place to sit in front of your yard. She said, oh no, I'll never sit in front of your yard. Oh, but what about when somebody comes to pick you up? What if you want to just kind of wait for them or something? Oh no, I won't do that. Well, two years later, I went past her house, and there was a little, little little French settee, you know, a little table and the chairs, and it's just wonderful. And even if you don't have time to sit there, it makes you feel rested. Isn't that nice? You know, something you love. My husband plays a saxophone, so he cut out wooden saxophones and put them on a gate. So you can think about what you like to do or what would be enjoyable. And then he has birdhouses, and I said, we've got to paint them pretty. And I think you have really pretty birdhouses here too. They're orange and purple and everything, and that makes me happy. So I've been rambling on for almost an hour, and I want to have questions. What kind of things didn't I cover that I I should have about about the plants? Oh, one thing: uh, how much pollen? How much pollen do you think a watermelon needs to make a produce water bomb? Any guesses? Is it 10 grains of pollen? Is it 200 grains of pollen? How many say 10 grains of pollen? How many say 200 grains of pollen? How many say 500 grains of pollen? 500 to 1,000 grains of pollen for one watermelon. So those bees are working their little tails off for you. Really amazing. And if we don't help them, we're not going to have food. Imagine. What happened to the bees? They were all destroyed because of pesticides and disease and whatever. We need to, we need to make our food. That's where our food comes from. It doesn't come from the grocery store. There, somebody told me they went to on a, on a hike uh, with the kids of uh, Boy Scouts, and they stopped at a at a garden and they pulled carrots out and they were going to cook them. And one little boy said, "I'm not eating those carrots. They're dirty. They come from a grocery store." And that's the problem with, with kids. And, and one more thing, and then I'll have questions. This year, I mean, I love gold beets. I love gold beets. And I got a pot, a pretty big pot, like this, and this wide. And I put in beets. I had it on the watering system, and I planted gold beets. And then I started harvesting them. And then I had lavender plants. And I started breaking the lavender on the bottom where it was kind of woody. I cut it off to about this big, and I stuck them in, in the pot, and so they get water. And then I end up with lavender plants. So how easy is that? So now I have something else I'm going to propagate, and I, and then I'm going to do some beans or something. But never, you know, I don't believe in a pot this big. It dries out too fast. If it's not 16 inches or bigger, to me it's too hard. And it, um, so no, let me be quiet, and I want some questions. I have encountered a bee here and there walking along the cement, and my dogs try to eat them, of course. But I always wonder, why are they down there? What, where did they come from? Did they fall? Well, I've had bees on my patio where there was no cracks, and they were going in circles, and I think they were poisoned. You know, but the neighbors had pesticides. But I've also had bees, like different insects, going around where the cracks were, and that's where they could be. Yeah, that's where there's cracks around that 
Right. That's where they could be having their homes. So you might be the grandmother to bees. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. So maybe I wouldn't go barefoot. Yeah, I don't use pesticides, so I don't think it's yeah. bad. Yeah. I wouldn't go barefoot. No. <laughs> I did that once, and uh, I, I, I had to walk through my nasturtium for some stupid reason. Actually, I had sandals on, and I got bit by a bee, and I didn't know it. I thought it was a sharp something, and I ignored it, and it, my foot got bigger and bigger. And finally, I thought, I'm going on a trip, and I went to a doctor. I had a staph infection. So if you get stung by anything, wash it off really well right away, because you never know. Oh, okay, any more? Yes. Oh yes, there's this horrible disease, uh, the short, in short it's called OE, and it makes a spore, and it'll go into a caterpillar and lay eggs, and it'll kill it. It'll lay eggs in there and, and they'll eat the insides out. And that could, that could happen at any stage. And like even a chrysalis, this chrysalis looks pretty healthy now, so I don't think it's gonna be bad, but sometimes you get a chrysalis and there's like a black spot on it, and if it's not developing properly, which it, pr it probably has that disease. And so you, you take it and you put it in a something so it does, those don't get out and you throw them in the garbage. But you don't let them get out. But yeah, that's what it is. And the problem is that that kind of um, milkweed, it grows all the time. So it's important to cut them down. Um, Professor Shapiro from one of the uh, University said you can use that milkweed, but you need to cut it down a few times a year and especially in the fall I cut it way to the ground and And then they'll come back really fast So you can maybe pu cut one all the way down and then let the other one go like that But that's what it is. So it's you have a uh, native milkweed also You have one here, right? The, the narrow leaf milkweed for some reason I never find anything on there because but they're kind of lazy, you know, they want, they, they want their caterpillars to grow. But if you get the native one, it has less chance for some reason of doing that. Plus, the native ones die off in the winter, and then they come back. No, you have to be trained with a microscope. Um, if you're really into butterflies, I was at a commercial butterfly place in Kentucky this summer, and believe it or not, they took, well, you can join an organization and you put little, they'll send you a little tape and you can put just a little tape on a caterpillar or a butterfly and send it in. And not the caterpillar, but the tape, you know, you just, and, it'll, and then you can send it in and they'll see if it's diseased or not. And, you know, if you're interested in it, send me an email and I'll tell you how to do that. But what this commercial place did is they, took the chrysalises and they actually put them in 10% bleach for a couple of seconds. I, couldn't, I, I was almost passing out because of the smell and I could not believe they were doing that to the, to the chrysalises, but they needed it clean. And if you have something like this, you need to clean this with 10% bleach. It has to be bleach. And I, what I, well this one deflates, you know, you push it down and and I took a plastic garbage bag and I put bleach water in there and I, I, I stuffed it down there overnight and then rinse it really well because it can last on these. Now this is kind of hard to get at because they're like this. There is a newer kind that has an opening here. And if you're interested, I can tell you how to get those. You can buy them online. They're really good. Um, any more questions? Yes. black and red. I hate those things. All they do is mate all day. I mean, that's, and I, I used to squish. I used to just squish. And I read the other day that I thought they were eating the milkweed, uh, the um, monarch eggs, but they say they only eat the leaves, but I don't like them. And that's what I do is I just squish. And, and, and they usually lay their eggs and have their babies in the, the uh, seed pod. 
So you can take the seed pot and um, put it in the garbage. I mean. I know, I don't want to spray them with it. Right, right. So I'm squishing. Some, yeah, sometimes I take a spray of water after the aphids just to get some of them off of there. But I hate to do that because there will be other things. Although the eggs on a, the monarch eggs will be on there really, really well. Um, any, any other questions? Yes. Well, I would rinse it with wa plain water then, because I don't know if the caterpillars would be happy with with that. But um, yeah, but even the aphids, once you knock them off, they won't come. So I would just do water, you know, kind of watch, watch what you do. Um, and one other thing about cleaning tools and happiness in the garden. Happiness in the garden is not when you have a slipper that's dull or dirty, and they, they harbor so many diseases. So the easy way, do not use bleach to clean metal stuff because it will pit it. Now I have a pair of Felcos, and these are expensive, and they're gonna last me forever. I take them apart and I clean them. Uh, they're also Corona. I also have a pair of Coronas. They sell them here. But you can sharpen them very easily yourself. And on the web, there are, send me an email, I'll tell you to watch. But I actually take mine all apart. I clean it and I put it back. But, you know, like uh, Schumann's kids have no shoes. Mine are always dir <laughs> dirty, too. But it's amazing how much better. And even if you just have, I, I take, to clean them, I take a, a Lysol wipe because you can put a couple of those in a bag in your pocket and when you're in the garden and you're sawing and you're, you wanna maybe clean your saws once in a while instead of spreading all this disease, and especially like one of these. But this morning, I, like last night, an easy way to do it is you get a little spongy, well, you know, with the, one, one of, you know, so it's rough like this. And then you can just go across here and on the other side and then you can take a very fine file. I have a, a Falco one. There's also a Corona one. But, and, and you do it at a 45 degree angle, only on one side. Uh, one side is totally flat. You just do this side at a 45 degree angle. If you're very careful, before you start, you can just kind of feel how sharp it is or how dull. And then after you do it, you can do it too, but be careful, they're really sharp. I cut my finger one day, because. Always watch where you're cutting. I was in a big shrub and I'm cutting and I cut my finger. I had to go to the ER, or urgent care. Not a good thing, so I don't do that anymore. But um, it's it's uh, with these Lysol wipes to me are the easiest and they're not bleached. They're not gonna wreck your clothes and they're not gonna wreck your your things like that. There's there's um, there's another uh, item I'd like this store to carry. And it's, if you're cutting lemons off a tree and it's really tall, there's a, a snipper, a big snipper that you just go like that. So I'm gonna talk to um, uh, Roger and see if we can get something like that here because they're so easy to use, they're just wonderful. Um, okay, if you, the other thing is, today I'm mercenary. This is one of my favorite tools. It's called a cobra head weeder. They're made in Wisconsin, and they're very, very good. I had a gardener come over, and he said, where did you get that? They're so easy to pull things out. If you have a big grass, I have this big grass that I'm cutting up, so I just go around the grass, and then I put this under, and I pull it up. I give these away for wedding presents. I mean, this and a good pair of pruners. This is what my friends get for wedding presents. Uh, and it's it's really great, but this, I'm. On the, on the web, they sell for $24.95, and I bought a whole bunch for my Master Gardener group, so they're allowing me to sell them here, and I'm selling them for $20. And if you're interested, I have them here, and you just check out at the, at the, at the front. And I'm also selling my book. Um, I'll just briefly tell you about my book. When I was working at UCSB, I one day had so many caterpillars, I didn't have enough milkweed for them. So I put two of them on the front seat of my truck. I had a, a Ford truck, and I loved that Ford truck. I put them on the front seat in a, in a little container. I spoke to them all the way home, and I named them Stanley after my favorite worker and Sergio. 
And when I got home, I I thought they're they're going to turn into uh, there were there were caterpillars, so they're going to turn into chrysalises, and I'll never find them again because I didn't have this kind of stuff, and I didn't want to do that. So I left them on my milkweed, which was 30 feet from my house. And I said, please make your Christmas by my dining room because otherwise I'll never see you again. I talked to them for an hour. And then I went to my husband and we had our martinis and we toasted them. And I, I, I felt really bad. I thought I'd never see them again. Well, three days later, my husband said, you're not going to believe this. But where we were toasting them, right under the table was a Christmas for me. And I'm sure it had to be them, one of them. I'm sure it was Stanley. And, and I, I thought, oh, this is like a miracle. That is so far to go. I mean, really, it was a long ways with steps and everything. And there he was. And I said, I got to write a book. So that's how this book started. And I didn't want, I wanted this to be an educational book. It's not a, a foo-foo book. You know, some of the pictures are foo-foo. And, and my, uh, uh, Kathy Crow is my illustrator. And she didn't understand a whole lot about butterflies. And she made it really in some ways, but they're really pretty pictures. And the other girl in here, the girl in here is Bonnie. She was another one of my workers. And she thinks, so it's about a little girl going through what I did. And she thinks that the monarchs are airplanes and the ladybugs are, are, are flight attendants on the, on the airplanes serving cheese sandwiches to the passengers. So anyway, it's a fun story, but it's true. I mean, not true. It's, it says real information. It, the mother showed the egg to the caterpillar, the whole thing. And then, you know, they watch him come out. And look at the milkweed. It's gone. So if your milkweed looks gone, don't worry. It'll come back. It will come back. And then she, and then she loses them. They're gone. I lost them. He, you know, th that's what happens. They, they move away. And then she finds him. And then it turns into a jay and then a chrysalis, and she waits, and out it comes. Now, here is a picture of a monarch butterfly, and it's got two little black dots. Is it a male or a female? How many say female? You say male. How many say male? It's a male. So now you learn something new today. The black dots on a butterfly says it's a male. Okay, it's, it's a sense on it. And then I have the migration maps because um, the, in, the, in, the, in Canada and New York and they fly to Mexico because it's too cold. In Colorado and Utah they fly here because it's too cold there and they come to the coast. They don't usually go to Mexico. That would be rare. And then I have facts about monarchs. I have how to do a butterfly garden. And then I have a song. And it, even if you don't buy the book, send me an email. I think my email is on the book, on there. I will send you the MP3. Uh, 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 Rebecca True is a singer-songwriter, and she wrote this song for her, her uh, son in kindergarten. And she said, you can use it for your book. So this is really good. Anyway, they're $16.95. They ha so yeah, they ha I have them here if you're interested. I've signed them already. And you can check out at the, at the counter. So, yeah. Let me just quickly say one thing. In the fall, October now, the butterflies in, in Toronto, in Canada, are going to be flying to Mexico. And they're going to be picking up their friends in Chicago and the Midwest, and they'll probably get on an airstream, not, a, not, the, not the vehicle, but the airs the real airstream okay and and that'll help carry them all the way to mexico because that's a long way imagine if you had to swim that far i don't think we'd make it so they're flying there and they're they're landing here and it's in the winter there and there is even snow on those trees so they're huddled together trying to keep warm a lot of them don't make it now in the spring maybe february they start wanting uh, they are not sexually mature these are the ones that come, most of the time, butterflies only live four weeks, like four to six weeks max. And the ones that uh, are ready to go in the fall, they're, not, they, they're different. They, they're going through a thing called diapause, and they, they're not sexually mature. So they fly 
all the way here, and they had to conserve their energy. If, if you're sexually mature, you, you, you have no energy. So anyway, they're, they're young. They come. So then here they, they mature, and they land in Texas, and they mate, and they have to find a milkweed, and she lays her eggs. And then they, she lays her eggs, and they die. Those butterflies die. But their eggs hatch, and they fly up to, let's say, Louisiana. Not necessarily, but you know, in that area. And then they mate, uh, and, and then they die, and then the babies come up to Chicago. And then those in this area go up to Canada. And by then, it's winter again, almost, and then they come back. But the ones in California, we have a lot of, that we all stay in California, right? We like it here. So they do too. So that's why I usually have a lot, except for if it's really cold. But the ones that are living over here in Utah and in the Colorado, they come to the coast. And then they go back. And those were the ones that used to go to Elwood. And it's so sad. It is so sad. But um, hopefully they'll, I won't see it. You won't see it. Maybe um, our grandkids might see them coming back. Okay. Thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience.